All right. Okay, well, I think we're live now. So welcome to the eviction moratorium uh, webinar where we have our friends, uh, Amanda and Laura from Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. And I know we'll have Hannah joining us soon. Um, just real quick, want to say how much we appreciate Laura and Amanda and the entire Southeast Louisiana Legal Services team for always being at the forefront of offering legal aid services, especially to you know, vulnerable households. So um, we think this webinar in particular is very, very timely given that the CDC has released new guidelines regarding the moratorium on evictions. And so we thought, you know, as United West Southeast Louisiana and leader in the policy and advocacy space, that we should put this topic out there in a way that would help you know, our nonprofit partners that serve individuals that may face eviction challenges uh, with the support and legal services that they may need. So that's the purpose of today. I think you're going to learn a great deal. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to, to Mary Johns and our marketing and resource development and communications folks for helping to, to put this together. Um, and I also want you to know that this is actually uh, co-sponsored and supported by our friends at the Capital Area United Way that serves the greater Baton Rouge area. My colleagues, George Bell, um, eagerly joined this effort to help promote it. And so, um, like we always say, we never do this work alone. We deeply appreciate George and the entire Capital Area United Way uh, team. So with that, we hope you learned a great deal, but I'm gonna turn it over to Laura to get us going. All right, thank you so much, Michael. And um, we wanna thank the United Way of Southeast Louisiana and also Capital Area United Way and all of the, any and all of the agencies uh, represented that are joining the call for your partnership, your support. The United Way of Southeast Louisiana has been um, really providing vital support to SLLS for as, as long as I've been there to help support some of our crisis stabilization work around uh, domestic violence and housing. Um, and we are thrilled to also have the support within the past year and a half uh, from the United Way, uh, the Capital Area United Way, where they're funding some of our work, working with um, homeless and other vulnerable populations uh, in the Baton Rouge area through our Homeless One Stop Project there. So we really just wanted to kind of bring some of our favorite partners and funders together uh, to, to share some information um, about the eviction moratorium, there's been different kinds of moratoriums, and so I won't get into all of that. I think between Amanda, who I'll introduce in a moment, she manages our um, housing unit in the New Orleans office, but we do housing work throughout our 22 parish service area, and we do much more than housing work. Um, as I mentioned, we do domestic violence, consumer work, we have a number of projects. The United Way of Southeast Louisiana helps fund some of our reentry work. We have um, some attorneys that specialize in work for, for veterans. Uh, we also have um, other kinds of family law work that may not involve domestic violence. We have a statewide low income taxpayer clinic. Uh, so we really have a wide range of different activities that, that we do for civil legal aid. And so if you're in the 22 parishes in Southeast Louisiana, kind of east of the Chafalaya, that's us. Um, so we are your local legal aid office, and we also have some really strong partnerships with some other providers. But what, what we're gonna be talking about today is the eviction moratorium, but also sort of what to expect uh, for the vulnerable people that, that we all serve and what may be coming down the pike. I can tell you that when we look at our case data, people that are calling us for services, when we compare that data for the first six months of um, this year as compared to last year, we saw a 300% increase in requests for legal help on evictions. Um, we have set up a COVID-19 legal helpline uh, that by the end of March 2020, we had set that up. And as of a few weeks ago, when I last checked, 80% of the calls coming in on that line are for evictions or for other landlord tenant disputes. So a huge amount of cases coming in for housing. Um, going hand in hand with that, 
Um, if you can't pay your rent, which is mostly what's going on, it's probably because you lost your job or you had uh, your hours greatly reduced because of COVID. And we've seen a 670%, which kind of blew me away, increase in the amount of people asking for our help with unemployment compensation issues. Um, that has calmed down a bit because unfortunately, a lot of those benefits, the special uh, increased benefits stopped and now the legislature has just gone back into session to try to deal with um, uh, how we're gonna keep paying for uh, regular unemployment claims. So there's that this huge connection that we're seeing. We are bracing ourselves for uh, an onslaught of evictions. We've already been seeing a lot. Uh, once you hear more about the Center for Disease Control Moratorium, you're going to know why we're really worried about what's gonna happen in January. Um, but I just wanna give a shout out to our housing team at SLLS. The, these, these mostly gals, but we do have, we do have a lone male attorney. <laughs> um, they have been out there literally on the streets with flask of sanitizer at their hips since right at, just right at the beginning. Um, and, you know, they, they get a COVID test every single week just because they are trying to make sure that they're healthy so they can help keep others healthy. So they're really our frontline people. And I just want to tell Amanda, thank you for her leadership. Amanda has been with us for, since she came shortly after Hurricane Katrina and has been doing housing work in our housing unit ever since. And they have been doing an incredible job on our housing team throughout our 22 parishes. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda and hopefully Hannah, who is dealing with an emergency eviction appeal issue will pop on. <laughs> yes, hello, oh, there's Hannah now. Hey Hannah, um, my name's Amanda Golub. I'm the managing attorney of the housing unit, as, as Laura said. Um, I will be leading the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So um, if you do have questions, write them down, keep them in your brain. Uh, we will get to those and we'll make sure that we're able to answer those and get you all the information that you need. Um, and Hannah will get into the details of, of the CDC moratorium and the order, but we, we think it's so important because we do think that with the declaration, there's a piece that y'all can help with and you can help uh, at least get the information out to people. So we're really thankful to have y'all here. Um, and, and have you with us um, and hopefully we can all work together to help as many tenants as possible. Uh, we're the ones, we go to eviction court with folks, we defend the evictions, we negotiate with landlords. Um, so that's the piece that we're most focused on. We're also doing a lot of advocacy with the courts to make sure they follow the CDC order, uh, the CARES Act, and then make sure that the courts are safe because eviction hearings are done in person and so we've done a lot of advocacy to make sure that the courts are safe and accessible and that if someone cannot physically go to court that they can have an accommodation um, so that they can have a remote hearing or have a hearing continued. Uh, so those are things to just keep in mind if somebody says I have a court date, I have to go in and I can't do it, I'm afraid of COVID, I'm immunocompromised, uh, that's something you can talk to us about. You can make a request to the court um, for a remote hearing or for that to be continued um, if, if they need a way for test results or something like that. Um, so I guess, Hannah, are, are we queued up and ready? Yep, we're good to go. Okay, this is Hannah Adams. She is an all-star housing <laughs> attorney in our office. She takes the lead on a lot. I'd say most of our <laughs> advocacy and our litigation, um, we're really trying to not just defend tenants and defend evictions, but proactively uh, support changes in um, the ways that the courts are accessed and the ways that evictions are handled and in just getting information to y'all, to caseworkers, to judges, to courts, um, to do the best we can to make sure that we are preventing as much homelessness as possible. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Hannah Adams. Hey everyone, and thank you so much for inviting us to speak with you today. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to share some important information for caseworkers on um, the general state of evictions and the CDC uh, moratorium specifically. So I'm actually, I have a PowerPoint. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen here. Hold on one moment. Okay, where'd it go? Okay. 
Share screen. Um, sorry, I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, great. Fabulous. Okay. Let me just get this started. There we go. Okay, great. So this presentation is going to cover um, an overview of tenant protections um, around evictions for caseworkers. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end. And um, I know we don't have much time, so I'm going to kind of zoom through. My contact information is on here. You can feel free to always give me a call or email me if you have any questions. I love, love working with caseworkers. The more support our clients have, the better and the easier it is to resolve their issues. I'm going to talk briefly about illegal evictions. Um, then I'm going to give a general overview of eviction protections under state law. I'm going to talk about the CDC eviction moratorium. I'm going to talk about uh, the care, what the remaining provisions of the CARES Act, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about reasonable accommodations and the court. So first of all, um, as I hope everybody knows, I wanted to start by saying it's totally illegal for a landlord to take any action to put a tenant out of their home without going through the court eviction process. I'm going to talk about what that entails in a moment. But um, basically, your la the landlord cannot um, lock someone out of the house, shut off their utilities, or physically remove them or their property um, without getting a court judgment of eviction and then something called a warrant for possession. If um, a landlord is threatening this um, or threatening to like call the police or call the sheriff, uh, we, tell, we tell people to, I'm sorry, I'm just turning my phone off. Um, we tell people to keep some information documentation on them, identifying their um, address if they're worried about being locked out. Um, that way, nobody can say they're trespassing. For example, if their ID has that address on it, or if they have a copy of the lease or a utility bill or something um, that they can hang on to, um, just in case, you know, the police show up. Um, if, just as a side note, if this happens to one of your clients, please contact us immediately. We do assist with these types of cases, um, trying to uh, get a court to order a, a landlord to let a tenant back into their property. So now I'm going to give you a brief overview on how evictions are supposed to work under Louisiana law. Um, there are sort of two types of evictions. There's uh, what, you, what we call four cause evictions. Those are evictions um, that are due to a tenant allegedly doing something wrong. Um, like violating the lease, not paying rent, um, uh, some other kind of lease violation, that type of thing. Um, the way that these evictions start is with a five-day notice to vacate. Um, the uh, notice to vacate um, can be waived under most leases. I had include he included in here for a presentation for permanent supportive housing case workers, and I forgot to change it. Um, for some federally subsidized tenants, that notice cannot be waived. So, for example, if you have a client who's on the Section 8 program, um, most, most clients that um, live in permanent supportive housing um, those programs uh, require minimum notice, so the five-day notice cannot be waived in the lease. For anyone just renting on the private market, a lot of leases in our area contain a clause called a waiver of notice, and that clause states that the landlord can go straight to court. Um, they don't need to file this notice first. The notice um, does not include weekends or holidays, and it can just be tacked to the tenant's door. And really, the only requirement is it has to say um, the reason for eviction. The, the next um, step is, um, oops, okay. The next step is um, the rule for possession. That is the petition that's actually filed in court um, to evict. And um, that uh, has to contain the same reason for eviction as the notice to vacate. It is also tacked on the door and it contains um, the you know, date and time and location of the court hearing that will be held on the case. Um, in, you know, the law requires that everyone have their day in court. So basically, a judge um, gets to decide whether the eviction is valid or not. Um, you know, so nobody ha gets to be put out before they have their day in court. Uh, following um, being served with the rule for possession, um, a tenant will have an opportunity to go to a hearing or trial. It is very helpful to have an attorney um, when you go to court for an eviction hearing. 
Um, so please do feel free to refer your clients to us or just call us if you have any questions about your clients. Um, and then after court, uh, a tenant can be given as little as 24 hours to move after court um, if the judgment is rendered in favor of the landlord. Now, that's if they win. A tenant could also get the eviction dismissed if um, the judge decides the landlord doesn't have a good reason to evict. Um, also, the parties could work out some kind of settlement agreement, like um, a repayment agreement or something like that. That's something we call a consent judgment. But anyway, if an eviction judgment is issued, the tenant can be given as little as 24 hours to vacate from that point. However, after the 24 hours, the landlord still can't um, come in, change the locks, do anything like that. The landlord has to go back to court and get something called a warrant for possession. It's sometimes called a writ of ejection or possession. And that enables the constable to come out and halt the eviction. I'm sorry, and, and uh, execute the eviction. The opposite of halt the eviction. Um, no cause evictions are the other general category of evictions. Um, these are like evictions just when um, a lease is expired and the landlord opts not to renew it. Under Louisiana law, unfortunately, um, uh, unfortunately under Louisiana law, there is no what's called good cause required uh, to not renew a lease. That means a landlord can choose not to renew a lease for any reason or no reason at the end of the lease. Um, there is an exception for some housing subsidy programs. For example, if you have a tenant that uh, rents in a uh, tax credit property, um, it's, the program is called Low Income Housing Tax Credit or LIHTC, um, they probably have like below market rent. Um, that program does require good cause to not renew a lease. And um, some other types of housing sub subsidy programs do as well. If you have questions about this, um, contact our office and we can look at your specific client and the program they rent in. Um, for a lease non-renewal, 10 days notice before the end of the month is required to terminate a month's month lease, unless the lease says otherwise. And 30 days notice is generally required to terminate a year lease. And this is 10 days before the end of the month and 30 days before the end of the year. It's not just any random 10 days or 30 days. Okay, so this brings us to the CDC eviction moratorium. So um, as I'm sure you've heard, <laughs> um, there is a new moratorium on evictions. It feels like the rules around evictions change every day <laughs> these days, and I, it is a little complicated to understand where we are. So I'm gonna do my best to kind of situate you. Um, as of September 4th, a new uh, temporary ban on evictions was put in place by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it's in place through December 31st, 2020. Um, this moratorium applies to certain evictions um, for, for certain reasons, including evictions for non-payment of rent. Um, and it applies to all types of landlords and properties, um, both subsidized and unsubsidized. So way back when we were primarily talking about the CARES Act eviction moratorium, you'll remember that we were talking about what kind of mortgage does the landlord have and do they participate in a federal subsidy program? None of that matters here. This applies to all landlords, all properties. However, it does not apply to all tenants. Um, the, it applies to tenants who qualify as covered persons. And so let's talk about what that means. Um, so a covered person under the order, and this is just the language from the order, um, a person is covered under the order if they give their landlord a declaration under penalty of perjury stating the following. They've used your, their best efforts to gain available government assistance for rent or housing. They expect to make less than $99,000 a year. Um, we're not required to report uh, income in 2019 or received a stimulus check. Those are just three ways of determining that somebody is lower income. Three, um, that they're unable to make full rent payments because of a loss of income or uh, extraordinary out-of-pocket medical expenses. Um, the, that they're using their best efforts to make timely partial payments. And that eviction would likely render the individual homeless, meaning they would have to um, double up with family or friends or uh, live in like a congregate shelter setting. Um, so again, the order doesn't require that the tenant um, uh, necessarily um, like prove each one of these things to the landlord. It just requires that they give the declaration 
that is under penalty of perjury. Now, it's under penalty of perjury, meaning it is a, a, a crime to sign it if the items in the declaration are not true for that person. And it could be prosecuted. Um, all adult members of the household have to fill this out. Um, and I actually link here to uh, the suggested declaration that we've drafted. And uh, here's a picture of it actually. Um, so our version um, uh, gives instructions both to landlords and tenants. The order says that, um, that uh, both landlords and tenants are subject to criminal penalties for violation. So a tenant needs to be sure that everything is true in the declaration before signing it. And a landlord um, may not take any action to remove or cause the removal of the person after receiving the declaration, or they might be subject to criminal penalties. So this could include uh, giving a notice to vacate, filing a petition for eviction, or filing a warrant for possession, um, or even, in my opinion, changing the locks. They can't do any of that after receiving the declaration. The problem is, um, you know, uh, it's dependent on the threat of, um, you know, the federal prosecutors prosecuting them. So it's, you know, we'll have to see how, how you know, how much um, clout that has ultimately. But, but yes, technically there are criminal penalties for violating. So we're encouraging people get these in, you know, sooner rather than later, because as soon as you give your landlord this, um, then it becomes essentially a crime for them to try to evict you. Um, although enforcement again is going to be challenging. So there, you know, like I said, um, the first page, um, we added a certificate of service. We are heavily encouraging people to, te uh, to text or email or um, send by certified mail this declaration because you need some kind of um, documentation of transmission. Texting is probably the easiest thing. Hand delivery is also okay, but um, you know, a landlord can always deny that they received it. And because the really important thing here is did you give it to your landlord, we think it's particularly important that you be able to document giving it to your landlord. Um, the second page contains the different um, uh, requirements of the declaration. Um, and it also notes that, you know, the rent is still due. It's not uh, canceled or anything by this declaration. And in fact, a landlord can still um, can still charge late fees, uh, it, you know, if somebody doesn't pay. And then come January 1st, all of that rent is due and somebody can be evicted for this. Um, so, you know, it really is important that tenants try to make payments, not, not only because otherwise they're going to have a huge debt in January, but also because under this order, you are required to make partial payments to the extent that you're able to after your non-discretionary expenses. Um, so, uh, you know, a couple notes here. You know, so there are people who will not qualify for this protection. If you have a client whose sole income is SSI, um, they did not lose any income due to the virus, um, and they didn't, um, you know, and, and they haven't had any out-of-pocket medical expenses, they may not qualify. Um, however, you can get creative here. The language is broad. So if they, um, I'm trying to think of an example. So if they, um, you know, normally had a lot of that SSI income to pay for rent, but because of the virus, they suddenly had to um, pay, uh, you know, a lot more money for, you um, to get Ubers everywhere because they can't take the bus because they're medically vulnerable. Let's say that. So, you know, instead of taking the bus everywhere, they're taking Ubers everywhere because it's uh, medically safer for them. Um, I say they have a loss of income due to COVID as a result of that. So, you know, it's not perjury to, uh, you know, that, that's certainly not perjury because it's true. So I guess what I'm saying is the language of the order is broad and so we should read it broadly. Um, you know, if somebody does not provide the declaration, then they're not covered by the order. So, you know, a big question has come up as to whether uh, judges or landlords, for that matter, can, you know, question tenants, ask for proof of these things. We say, no, they can't. But let's be real. The judges are going to ask questions and um, tenants need to be prepared to answer those questions. So we recommend that tenants keep a written documentation of every attempt they've made to gain assistance. On Monday, I called the church. They said, you know, we're out of money. On Tuesday, I applied online for the city program. I haven't heard anything yet. On Wednesday, I called the state. They said they're out of money. I mean, you know, it's going to be depressing, but you have to be able to show that you made the effort. And um, then number two, um, 
I would recommend that anyone who um, is able to pay any rent, um, make basically a monthly, actually everyone should do this, make sort of like a monthly budget showing your non-discretionary expenses like your um, utilities, your uh, food, things like that. Um, things that you can't avoid paying, medical expenses, transportation, and then um, whatever amount is left over, that's the amount that needs to be paid as rent. And if your landlord won't accept partial payments, even if it's a hundred bucks, even if it's 20 bucks, um, then the tenant should get a money order you know, with the date they, they tried to pay and keep it somewhere safe so that someday if they end up in court, they can bring the money orders and show it to a judge. And the judge um, will be able to see that they've attempted to make partial payments in accordance with the order. So those are a couple of um, recommendations that we have um, in terms of uh, just sort of protecting, you know, tenancy to keep some documentation, even though we don't think it should be required, we know it's going to come up. So better safe than sorry. Um, under the order, uh, tenants can still be evicted for engaging in criminal activity on the property, threatening the health or safety of other residents, damaging or posing an immediate or significant risk of damage to property, violating any building code, health ordinance, or similar regulation related to health or safety, or violating any other lease requirement other than payment of rent. So this is important. This list does not include straight lease non-renewal for no reason. However, um, we are seeing a lot of judges argue that um, failure to move essentially after receiving a notice of non-renewal is a lease violation. I disagree with that and we're prepared to take the right case up to the Court of Appeals, but right now we just don't have any more guidance from the federal government. So long story short, um, we think that it protects against um, what we call no cause lease non-renewals, but a lot of judges disagree with that. So we're gonna kind of just have to, have to see how it goes. Um, you know, if you have a case where it's really obviously about rent, <laughs> like landlord gave a notice um, to vacate for non-payment of rent, received the declaration, and then all of a sudden gave a notice to vacate just for non-renewal, then you might have a sense that this is actually about rent. And we think that in those cases, we might be able to get judges to rule in our favor on this. Yeah, this is what we were just talking about. This is kind of the ambiguity in the law. And it really is a problem because we have so many tenants here in New Orleans and across the state who are in month to month leases. That's what Louisiana law says happens to a year lease after the first year, it becomes month to month. Um, we looked up census data and saw that something like 65% of New Orleans renters have been living in their house for over a year. So by that rule, you know, we, we're looking at probably half of renters are month to month. So it seems to defeat the entire purpose of the order if they can just be put out because their lease is expired. But um, again, you know, we're gonna be forcefully making that argument and we'll have to see how the courts rule. Um, I wanted to mention also that there are a couple provisions of the CARES Act that are still in effect. Um, just one second. Um, the CARES Act, as you might remember, is the large stimulus law that was passed by uh, Congress um, back in March. It was effective on March 27th. A lot of this law, um, you might remember, it had a sort of robust uh, moratorium on evictions for certain types of properties. Um, and that moratorium on evictions expired at the end of July. However, there are a couple of provisions that are still in effect that I want to just remind people of. Um, a reminder first that to be a covered property under this law, um, you have to uh, be at a property that participates in a federal housing subsidy program or that has a federally backed mortgage. So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty here, but basically even if there's one subsidized tenant at that property, the whole property is going to be covered. Um, and basically, again, I won't go through this in too much detail, but um, all of the big um, HUD housing programs, um, Department of Agriculture housing programs, the tax credit program through the Treasury Department, um, they're all, they're all going to be covered. The rural housing voucher program is covered. And um, the other category of properties that's covered is those that have a federally backed mortgage. So that's going to be your um, FHA mortgages, USDA, that's the Department of Agriculture, the VA, and then any mortgage purchased or um, owned by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. So again, I don't want to confuse us here. 
um, under the CDC order where the declaration is required, that applies to all properties. None of this matters for that. All properties, I don't care what kind of subsidy, what kind of mortgage, doesn't matter. This is just for the limited protections that still uh, exist under the CARES Act, which is the earlier law that contained a largely expired moratorium. Um, so the part that is still in effect, number one, is that the law required a 30-day notice um, from covered properties to evict tenants, um, definitely for non-payment of rent, possibly for other reasons. So um, that provision doesn't have an end date or a sunset date. So we argue it's still in effect. So covered properties, again, properties with federally backed mortgages and that participate in federal subsidy programs, they have to provide a 30-day notice of eviction for non-payment of rent, to make it simple. Um, and uh, you know we don't see people doing that. Um, they seem to have forgotten about this law. So if you if you um, have an issue with that, if somebody gets a five day notice to vacate and they're at a federally subsidized property, I would recommend that you um, you know contact an attorney. And then the other kind of obscure provision of the CARES Act that's still in effect is that multifamily properties with federally backed mortgages in forbearance, meaning they temporarily don't have to make their mortgage payments, they cannot evict or charge late fees during the forbearance period. So it's a little tricky to figure out, um, like, is your property covered or not? Um, there are some online resources. Uh, give us a call if you have a concern about this and we can look it up for you. But basically, um, uh, I'll actually show you in a moment. There's an online resource um, that you can uh, try to look up the property. Um, and then the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about, and then I'll, I'll get, take you on a quick online tour of a couple of resources, is um, reasonable accommodation. So we have a lot of very medically vulnerable shared clients right now, people with asthma, diabetes, heart disease, other comorbid health conditions that make them more vulnerable to COVID-19, um, to, well, to serious illness if infected with COVID-19. And these people um, should not have to physically come to court if that is dangerous for their health. Um, so we did a lot of advocacy early on with some other organizations and um, we were successful in getting established uh, reasonable accommodation policies at uh, most of our area courts. Uh, really, they're required statewide. The ADA um, or Americans with Disabilities Act, it uh, requires that people with disabilities receive um, essentially special treatment um, and that exceptions to normal rules and policies be made for them if they need that because of their disability. So uh, that means that if a person with a comorbid health condition um, needs a video hearing because they can't safely come to court, um, the court must provide it. Um, so your, uh, anyone served with an eviction in, uh, in New Orleans and in some other parishes um, should receive um, a documentation uh, explaining how to request a remote hearing or, or a other type of accommodation. Um, and if they don't receive that paperwork, you can still request it um, in, and should request it. It's, it's, it's the right of a person with disability, similar to how a person who um, speaks uh, American Sign Language is entitled to a sign language interpreter. A person who cannot physically attend court due to health conditions is entitled to um, a video hearing or other type of accommodation. It's important to request these as soon as possible after receiving a service, after being served with, you know, with notice of the hearing. I'm gonna show you some online resources, but first I just wanted to um, share our contact information. My contact information is at the top. I'm always happy to talk, answer questions, brainstorm uh, solutions to issues your clients might be facing. Um, and then in addition, uh, we uh, have a couple of hotlines I want to share. We have a COVID-19 hotline for all types of COVID-19 related legal issues. That would include unemployment issues, food stamps, really anything else related to the virus. And that's 844-244-7871. Um, we really encourage you to share that contact information with your clients. We have a quick turnaround time and do try to get to, back to people in... Um, you know, within like 24 to 48 hours. And then um, if you are serving clients in the Metro New Orleans area, so New Orleans, um, uh, Jefferson, St. Bernard, Plaquemines, St. Tammany, St. Charles parishes, um, we do have a, um, 
what is essentially a, a housing unit hotline just for this area. And that's the 529-1000 number, extension 223. Um, we encourage people to call that number and leave a message. And we have um, attorneys all day long checking that voicemail. And we try to get people a uh, call back the same day or the next day. And you can see our website. We have offices also across um, 22 parishes in the state. We have uh, six offices total. So we really have a, a wide coverage and um, are, are thrilled to um, collaborate on cases and help uh, clients out. So let me, um, I'm just gonna uh, stop sharing this and just show you a couple of other things real fast. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. I wanted to share with you, um, what I'm showing you now for those of you in New Orleans is our local court website. I wanted to show you where you can request an accommodation for a tenant if um, somebody cannot come to court physically because of a disability. Um, if you go up to the top of the page, you'll see Americans with Disabilities Act accommodations. If you click on that, um, you'll see that there is a form uh, that you can click on and uh, fill out to request an accommodation. And it doesn't have to be a video hearing. If someone is in the hospital, you can request a postponement or continuance. Um, but here is the form that the court is using and there are instructions on where to submit it. The other resource I wanted to show you is um, a resource that a national housing organization put together for how to look up if a property is covered under the CARES Act. This, um, this, only, uh, this only works for multifamily properties, so it's not going to work for small doubles, quads, that type of thing. But um, as you can see, um, well, if it works, yeah, you can basically type in a zip code. And this database aggregates data from HUD, the Department of Agriculture, the tax credit program, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and a couple of other places. And you, and you can search by zip code and see um, you know, if the property possibly is covered under the law. Now, again, I wanna caution you, this is only about um, the remaining provisions that are in effect for the CARES Act, that 30-day notice, and the thing about um, multifamily properties with mortgages in uh, forbearance. Um, the CDC moratorium that we spent the majority of our time discussing um, applies to all properties. It doesn't matter mortgage, subsidy, any, any property uh, counts under that order. Um, what they're looking at instead is whether the person is covered, not the property, the tenant. And the tenant is covered if they provide that declaration. So you can really help your clients with this declaration. We've been doing the same. Um, we're trying to get the declaration out to all of our clients who are struggling to pay rent right now. Um, and, um, you know, you can also help them transmit it if they fill it out and you email it to a landlord, text it to a landlord, certify mail it to a landlord. Um, that is allowed and that is a great help. Um, so you can really help us by getting these, uh, these um, declarations out to our various clients. And like I said, it's linked to on our website. I just want to share one more thing. We have a... Um, I want to show you where to find this on our website. Um, if you go to slls.org slash blog, you'll see that we've posted a whole lot of extremely useful resources about all different topics related to COVID-19. If you scroll down, you'll see um, we have an FAQ on the CDC order halting evictions. And this is ex an extremely detailed um, FAQ that we put together. I hope it'll answer most of your questions. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but there is a link here that you can click um, and there is a copy of our um, declaration. And I think we're also happy to email that around after this presentation. And again, we this is not the same declaration that everyone is using. We're suggesting using this one because we think it has clearer instructions for both parties and because it contains this uh, certificate of service piece at the bottom, which we think is useful and important. So again, remind your tenants, um, in order to qualify for this, they have to try to pay partial payments. They have to try to get government assistance and um, all that money is gonna become due. I mean, it's due now, but it's gonna become due 
definitely um, around January 1st, um, unless this order is extended. So um, I guess I'll wrap up there. Um, that's a brief overview of um, the current state of evictions in Louisiana and in New Orleans. And um, like I said before, we're really happy to um, work with you all in cases and happy to take referrals. And, and thank you so much uh, for your support. All right, thank you, Hannah, for that. Um, if, if folks do have questions, if you wanna just uh, type them into the chat um, and then I can read them and then we can try to, to answer any questions you have right now. Um, I will email uh, the wonderful folks who put this together our declaration so that they can, they can disperse that. You can also find it you know, on, on the website. Um, so yeah, we have a Q&A portion right now, so we're happy to answer any questions. Also, Hannah uh, provided our contact information if you have specific questions for a specific client or a specific situation that you might not wanna share with everybody, um, or um, if you just have a general question that you would just like to ask privately, that's totally fine. We are here to help and get, and get this out to folks. And um, the more folks you can fill out this declaration and get it to their landlord sooner, hopefully you know, we'll be able to, to work something out with them so that we're not uh, fighting evictions in court. We really are trying to avoid uh, making it <laughs> to, to court and to that part of the process. Um, and you know, also trying to, we have this new CDC order and we, we, we want people to know about it and people to know if they qualify for it, if they're a covered person and to be able to access that. Um, and then also the continued information, which Hannah did a great job of with the CARES Act, that there still is a part of the CARES Act that, that still applies because a lot of people think that that ended um, at, at July 25th um, when that part of the moratorium was lifted. So, um, okay, we have a question. What legal rights does a person have if they have been illegally evicted? Um, Amanda, can you handle this one? I just need to run this uh, motion over to Elizabeth real fast. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So uh, when you say illegally evicted, um, what I would guess is that the landlord has taken some sort of action. They've changed the locks. They have uh, taken the tenant's items and thrown them out. Um, so it really, uh, it depends on the situation. Um, if the locks have just been changed, uh, there's a couple things you could do. Technically, you are, still have a right to the property, so you can get the locks changed back. You can enter the property through another way if you have another you know, way to get in there. Um, if you call the police, they will say it's a civil matter, so they're not gonna get involved. Um, if the landlord has thrown all of your stuff out um, and you're dealing with the loss of items, you would need to file a lawsuit. Um, we can also, and our office will help with this, we will file injunctions where we get a court order to order the landlord to change the locks back, to restore the possessions, um, and, and then we would also file a lawsuit for damages. But a lot of times, you know, when this happens with a landlord, like at the beginning of COVID, for example, um, we had a landlord who changed the locks on a client, um, wouldn't change them back. We got a court order where the court ordered her to change the locks back. She still didn't do it for nine more days. Um, so now we won a petition of damages against her and she was held in contempt of court because she violated a court order. Um, and she faced potential uh, criminal um, charges for that as well. So uh, if someone is le illegally locked out in any of those situations I just listed, um, if their stuff is put out, if they're illegally evicted, uh, which is any, it's anything that the landlord does that does not involve uh, the courts. So cutting the utilities off, uh, we call that a partial illegal eviction. Um, a lot of landlords, I mean, honestly, right now, because of the moratorium, they're not able to evict in the same way they were before. And in general, a lot of landlords don't wanna pay. Um, most court evictions cost them about $200. Um, sometimes it's a little less if they're in a JOP, but it is free to <laughs> change the locks and harass your clients. So oftentimes they'll, they'll do that um, instead of, of following the right process. And a lot of tenants will just take their stuff and move because they don't know or they are scared. Um, so they can come to us for that help and those would be the, the basic remedies for that. Um, if there's something more specific, uh, you can put that in the chat, but that would be the, the basics of the illegal eviction, um, which we are really trying to prevent. Um, so what is the best way to refer clients? Um, Y'all can email us, uh, Hannah posted the information. We do have our COVID housing number, which Hannah posted. 
Um, we can also make sure to email that around with the declaration uh, so that we just have all that information in one place. Um, but that would be the best way is to call the, the COVID housing line. If you have an emergency, state that in the message, this is an emergency um, so that we can make sure to get that right away. We are getting a lot of calls and we are calling everybody back within a day. Um, but if it's an emergency, we can call them back right away. You can also contact Hannah or myself um, directly uh, and we'll make sure to provide that, that information. I'm back. Sorry about that. Well, I've answered the two questions we have. I guess you did such a good job that uh, folks don't have <laughs> any other clarifications, um, which is great. Uh, like, like we said, the order, you know, the CDC order is, it's just once you break it down, it is pretty straightforward and it's just a matter of, of people accessing that information. So um, if we don't have any other questions, uh, Michael, are we turning this back over to you? Uh, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Okay, um, well, assuming there are no more questions, let me just take a minute to, to thank uh, Hannah, Amanda, and Laura once again. And I know the entire team over at Southeast Louisiana Legal Services that's um, working on important issues like this. I found the information myself to be extremely helpful. Um, and so I hope others did as well. And of course, if you have any questions after this, uh, after this webinar, please let us know or share those with Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. I'm sure they'll be glad to answer them. But we think this is such important work. With, you know, so many struggling families right now, managing so many different challenges. You know, addressing issues around eviction um, are, um, are just one more thing to worry about. I did see a, a message pop up in the chat. Real quick, look at it because I'm on my phone. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Can we share the slides? Absolutely, we'll make sure we work with Laura and her team to get the slides out to you. But if there are no more uh, questions, once again, Laura, Hannah, Amanda, we appreciate all you do. Um, and I hope everybody out there stays well. Y'all have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you so Bye-bye. Thanks Bye. for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you.